so I'm Caitlin. I'm a fourth year PhD student, I think, um, working under the supervision of both Dr. Gozen and Dr. Beckman. And today I'll be talking about the direct ink writing of ceramic matrix composites. So first, just to introduce why we're looking at ceramic matrix composites, I don't think I really need to motivate why we're interested in ceramics, um, but we can say that we're looking at ceramic matrix composites to improve the fracture toughness of the ceramic matrix. So CMCs or ceramic matrix composites are ceramic matrices that are loaded with a reinforcement. And we're gonna talk about specifically fibers here. And so chopped fibers are simpler to process because they're chopped up fibers, but they have properties that are inferior to their continuous fiber counterparts. <sighs> So we're hoping to be able to essentially enhance the use of chopped fiber ceramic matrix composites by using 3D printing to induce fiber alignment along the print direction, which will improve part performance. And so that's why we're interested in direct ink writing, because studies have shown that direct ink writing can actually control the microstructures of, of particles and fibrous additives by aligning them in the print direction. And so direct ink writing is an extrusion based additive manufacturing method in which you have an ink that is loaded into a syringe and that ink is then subjected to a back pressure and then essentially pushed through a nozzle and extruded onto a build plate. And so these studies that have shown uh, particle alignment essentially is this this particle alignment is caused by the shear flow that happens during the extrusion process, and we see microstructural control from that shear flow. And so our hope here is that we can exploit that microstructural control to, you know, actually enhance those material properties that we're interested in. So just to highlight a few goals for this study, we need to determine some composition rheology relationships of these CMC yielding polymer composite inks because our inks are going to start as a polymer and then pyrolyze into a ceramic. And so we also want to actually look at shear flow and wall slip. Um, these are just two flow mechanisms that the inks experience during extrusion. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about more about them later. So we want to look at those contributions to the overall strain rate experienced by the ink during direct ink writing. And we want to correlate those flow mechanisms to the microstructural evolution that we see during printing. And then finally, actually look at all the interconnectedness of the variable of the variable groups using uh, data science techniques. So the first thing that we needed was we needed to design an ink that was repeatably mixable and printable while still having the ceramic chemistry we want. And we wanted to reach solid loading comparable to literature. So there's kind of a whole story behind this. We tried a whole bunch of different things. Um, the first thing we tried was loading up polyethylene oxide with alumina um, because that was what we had in our lab. So we just wanted to see what we could do with it. And we found that the alumina agglomerated very intensely and that happened regardless of the polymer binder we were using. So after PEO, we tried using polyvinyl pyrolidone or PVP and we saw the same result. And then when we got SMP10, we tried that with SMP10 as well as with uh, a deflocculant. And we did see that we could get um, an ink that was mixable and printable. Um, and I did some rheology on it to show that we could actually get a usable ink. Um, but our alumina concentration in this ink, we, we couldn't really surpass 13 volume percent, which was not comparable to literature at all. Um, so we wound up getting zirconium diboride and found that it was much easier to mix into our SMP10 than um, alumina. And so we wound up moving forward with that. Um, and so our goal composition is going to be the SMP10 uh, matrix, which SMP10 is going to pyrolyze into silicon carbide. So we're going to have a silicon carbide matrix with zirconium diboride particles and then more silicon carbide chopped fibers. And we haven't actually worked with any fibers yet, but I just wanted to show that this is kind of like our goal that we're shooting for. Um, so now just to go over some of the rheology we've done on these inks, um, we see that the material has a yielding point from our amplitude sweep, um, which is something that we need for direct ink writing because you want to, for direct ink writing, you want a material that behaves like a solid at low strain rates so that it can have good shape retention but that will still flow at sufficiently high strain rates so that you can actually extrude it out of your nozzle. So we saw that through the, um, I'm gonna do a laser pointer. 
So we saw that through the crossover right here at the very end. Um, we did see some interesting behavior in the amplitude sweep. I'm not exactly sure what's happening in it. So usually what is typical of highly loaded composites is that we see what's called the pain effect, which is essentially like a plateau in the linear viscoelastic region, and then a crossover point that shows yielding and then another plateau. But we're not seeing that here. Um, we're not exactly sure why, so that's going to involve some more experimentation and some more studying. Um, our flow sweep did show that we have shear thinning behavior, which is good. We want a viscosity that will decrease with shear rate. And if we assume the Herschel Buckley model, we see that our material has a yield stress of about 200 pascals, which, as you'll see in the coming slides, isn't it's not bad for printing. It's printable, but there is some significant layer something that happens. But I think that this will serve as a good starting point for fiber loadings, because, of course, adding fibers in will increase that yield stress and overall viscosity. Um, and so the last thing we looked at is what's called the strain step change. The strain step change essentially looks at the printability of an ink where we strain an ink um, at a strain rate at a strain rate that will induce a stress below the yielding point, so below the yield stress, so that we can observe the solid like behavior. And then we increase that stress or that strain rate so that the so that the ink experiences a stress higher than the yield stress, and we see flow. And that flow is uh, that flow is shown qualitatively by the loss modulus here being greater than the storage modulus. So the loss modulus can be thought of as the materials liquid like behavior and the storage modulus can be thought of as a material solid like behavior. So when the storage modulus is greater than the loss modulus, that means the material is behaving like a solid. So we want to see this solid to liquid transition um, and good recovery. So we want to see it happen quickly. So that was one other thing that we looked at with this ink. Um, and so after doing a little bit of preliminary rheology to get uh, to get an idea of what we were looking at, we wanted to start doing some characterization. So we cured and centered various parts um, and found that uh, significant oxidation was happening, which thinking about it, we weren't centering it in a controlled atmosphere. So it makes sense that oxidation was happening, but we wanted to see what exactly we were looking at. Um, so we looked at it in the XRD and found that there are two different phases of zirconia here, as well as the zirconium diboride, which makes sense because that's our particle. But we also saw that there we didn't really see any silicon in here. So my assumption is that this particular piece, so this printed part, was centered at too low of a temperature, and we were actually like not fully crystallizing our material. So we were having amorphous silicon carbide in this sample. Um, so going forward, we're going to need to increase that to actually get crystalline silicon carbide. So the next thing we did was EDX, just to see where in our sample the zirconium and the silicon were, and to see like if we were actually centering anything. Um, from all this, we learned that we need to center our materials higher at, at a higher temperature and in a controlled environment because our, our zirconium particles aren't centering well, which makes sense because zirconium uh, zirconium diboride is known to need a high centering temperature all the way up to like 22 degrees C, which we were not centering it at. So we're going to need to repeat some of these experiments at higher temperatures and look at them under the SEM and see what the centering behavior will have, uh, what the centering behavior will be at these higher temperatures. Okay, so I wanted to introduce our next characterization technique. It's called capillary rheometry. So capillary rheometry is essentially looking at our flow behaviors of our materials uh, during the printing process. Because capillary rheometry involves extruding a material through a capillary or a nozzle. So we're doing that on this um, a custom built dual purpose direct ink ray print head that has capillary rheometry capabilities built into it. So this is a print head that we can print and run these experiments from. Um, and so what happens here is our ink is extruded through the nozzle and before the nozzle is this pressure sensor. And so we can monitor the pressure that the ink is experiencing in real time. And from that pressure, we can calculate flow rate. And so we can monitor the flow rate in real time as well and see how like what happens to our flow rate over time. And we saw that 
um, using our CMC inks, there were really unsteady flow rates happening um, at multiple different pressures. I just have two here shown as examples. And so what we expect to see is like a good steady state flow rate, but we never really saw that. And so we back we backtracked uh, because we wanted to benchmark our system with silicone, but we also saw unconventional results with the silicone because uh, there were some very notable oscillations happening uh, in the flow rate as a function of time, which isn't exactly normal. Um, and so we, you know, further investigated what was happening in the system, and we found that uh, the pressure was fluctuating as well, um, a lot as well, as well as um, the steps that the lead screw was taking during um, during printing. And so we're attributing this oscillation to the fact that there's essentially too much room in the piston for the lead screw. So, I mean, I'm doing this on camera, so hopefully it like kind of makes sense. But if this is our piston and our lead screw is set in our piston here, when we retract the piston, because sometimes a retractive motion is needed to maintain that constant pressure, when we retract, retract the piston, there's, you know, X amount of microns gap that the lead screw can move before the piston actually moves with the lead screw. And we're attributing that to a lot of the weird results that we're seeing here, which led to just a need to overall redesign this print head. Um, and to just, you know, essentially sanity check what we're looking at. We're also planning to redo these experiments um, on a more well-trusted system that we know is going to behave the way that we expect it to. Um, and so, what happened with this print head and the reason we think it's happening is because this this printer was or these print heads were designed only for forward motion because it's a printer um but of course you know like i said retractive most retractive movements are necessary sometimes and so because we're essentially forcing it to do something it's not meant to do we're getting a lot of this weird feedback um I mean, with that in mind, though, we did do some printing. We did not print on this print head yet. We've done printing on the stock print head. Um, and I just wanted to show the two different compositions we've managed to print because we did manage to print the alumina ink. But I mean, like I said before, there's a very low volume concentration of alumina and we needed a lot of deflocculant in it to actually get it to be extrudable. Um, whereas the zirconium diboride ink, yes, there's some layer merging and there's some slumping happening, but since we're planning to load this with fibers anyway, I figured that this is going to be a good starting point based on this print result, because like I said, the yield stress is only going to increase with the addition of fibers. And so with this, we have some room for that increase without making printing too much more difficult. Okay, so. Going forward, um, we're planning to, like I said, tr test these ceramic inks on that well-trusted capillary rheometry setup, and we're going to implement that new print head design. And in addition to that, I've already sintered some parts at a higher temperature. We're starting at just 1400 C to see what happens, and I need to prepare that for observation under the SCM. And um, yeah, once we get all of the print head stuff figured out, we're going to start collecting more capillary rheometry data on different uh, nozzle geometries, as well as doing some particle size analysis of our fibers. Thank you.